It's just our everyday experience. And when we look in a sheet of glass or a mirror, we can see a reflection of ourselves. We can see an image produced by the light reflected from that solid surface. But why can't we see our image when we look at any solid surface like a sheet of paper? Well, it has everything to do with how light bounces off of a sheet of glass versus paper. On the left, you can see a laser beam coming in in one particular direction, and when it hits the paper, it's not actually bouncing off in any particular direction. It's actually bouncing off in all directions. The light gets dispersed. That's why you can't see a beam after it hits the paper. In contrast, when the light comes in and hits a mirror or a smooth, solid surface, it bounces off in one particular direction. This is known as diffuse reflection, as in the example of the paper, and specular reflection with any kind of smooth surface, whether it's a mirror or water or polished metal. With diffuse reflection, if light's coming in in one direction, if the surface is irregular and not smooth, then that light will bounce off in lots of different directions. With a mirror, when the surface is smoother, if we have a smooth enough solid surface or still water, then when light comes in in one direction, it's going to bounce off in only one direction. Curved surfaces can also produce images from reflected light. Here's an example of what's called a concave mirror, where the middle of the mirror is farther away from the object and the, the edges are a little bit closer. I placed a tea light candle in front of this large concave mirror, fairly close to the mirror, and you can see on the right the image that actually gets produced. It looks like the tea light candle. It's just bigger. It's not upside down. It's upright, and it's bigger. Now, that image that's produced is produced by the light given off by the flame that bounces off the mirror and then comes back to the camera making the video, and also the reflected light off of that silver container holding the wax on the bottom of the tea light candle. That also bounces off the mirror and comes back to the camera. So when objects are close to concave mirrors, or these kind of curved mirrors, they make upright, bigger images. Here you can see I'm standing in the background. I'm much farther away from this concave mirror. And what does the reflected light coming off of me produce when looking in the mirror? It's an upside down image. And the image actually appears much smaller than what I would appear if you just looked at me from that same distance. So concave mirrors can actually produce two different kinds of images depending on how far away the object is. If we have the close object like the tea light candle, the image that gets formed can be bigger and upright. And if the object is farther away from the mirror like me waving in the back of the classroom, then it's smaller and upside down. The other kind of mirror that we're going to talk about is called a convex mirror. And with a convex mirror, the middle of the mirror actually bulges out at you. So it's closer to you than the edges are. Just like the last mirror, I put a tea light candle in front of this convex mirror, fairly close. And you can see the reflected image is still upright, but it's not bigger. It's actually smaller than the actual object, the actual tea light candle. Now, if you look at me in the background, I'm not upside down anymore, but I'm also smaller. Now that we've seen what kind of images these two different kinds of mirrors produce, both concave and convex mirrors, we need to figure out, well, why do these mirrors produce these kind of images? And, and how could we actually predict what kind of image it would produce, given the distance that an object is from the mirror and knowing something about those mirrors? So in order to explain that, we first need to look at the idea of reflection. When light is coming in and hits a smooth, solid surface like a mirror, if it comes in at a particular angle, what angle does it bounce off at? So how does the angle of light traveling after reflection relate to the angle of light was traveling before reflection? Here we have a laser beam coming in and bouncing off of a flat mirror. You can see that it's coming in from the left and bouncing off to the right. And I'm going to put a line that's perpendicular to the surface of the mirror where the light hits. We always measure angles relative to a perpendicular or normal line to the surface. On the left side, you can see that the light is coming in at an angle of about 26 degrees relative to that perpendicular line to the surface. And when it bounces off, looks like it's also bouncing off at about 26 degrees. The angle is the same. The reflected angle is the same as the incoming angle or what's called the incident angle. Let's change the angle and see if that still holds true. So here's a larger angle. Here's our perpendicular line again. You can see the incoming angle is about 60 degrees on the left. The reflected angle is also again about 60 degrees. Here's another larger angle. About 76 or 77 degrees is coming in from the left, measured from that perpendicular line. And again, the reflected angle is the same, about 76 or 77 degrees. If we shine the laser straight down, what's the incoming angle? 
Well, if it's coming down along that perpendicular line, there's no angle between that and the perpendicular line. So we'd say the incoming or incident angle is zero degrees. And if the incoming angle is zero, the outgoing also has to be zero. This is consistent with what we saw in the last three examples. So in all four examples, the reflected angle was the same as the incoming angle as measured from the perpendicular line from the surface. But what about curved surfaces? Because we're also trying to figure out why images form in concave and convex mirrors. Here's an example of a laser hitting a curved surface. This is a convex mirror. So let's draw a perpendicular line at the surface of the curve right where the light happens to hit. In order to figure out where the perpendicular direction is, we have to first draw a tangent line. So we're going to draw a tangent line right where the light hits, and now we can draw a line perpendicular to that to find out how does the reflected angle compare to the incoming or incident angle. And you can see that on the left, it's coming in at about 70 degrees relative to the perpendicular line, and it's bouncing off again at 70 degrees. So this idea of the reflected angle being the same as the incoming or incident angle, it works the same for flat mirrors, and it also works the same for curved mirrors. So this is actually known as the law of reflection. It states that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence, or that incoming angle, relative to a line perpendicular or normal to the surface. So theta 1 equals theta 2. Knowing this can actually help us explain how any image is formed in a flat mirror, a concave mirror, or a convex mirror. Let's imagine we have three lasers all pointing to the right at three different flat mirrors. The first one's gonna come in and hit the mirror, and I've already drawn a line perpendicular to the surface so we can predict where the reflected ray is going to go. So the incoming angle is gonna be the same as the reflected angle. So it's gonna bounce off in this direction. The second laser is gonna come in and hit the mirror, and let's assume it hits straight on. So it's coming in at an angle of zero degrees relative to that perpendicular line. So it's gotta bounce back in the same direction it came. And if we look at the third path from this third laser beam, it's going to come and hit our angled surface. We're going to draw our normal or perpendicular line, and the reflected ray has to go off at the same angle relative to the initial or the incident angle. And what do you notice about all three reflected light rays? They all seem to come together again at some common focal point. And we're going to come back to this, but I want to go back to just this first laser path real quick. If the laser comes in like this and bounces off, it's going to follow this path, like we said, which is through this focal point. And this happened because of the law of reflection. The theta 2 right here, the reflected angle is the same as the incident angle. That's theta 1. Well, let's imagine, so this path is true. Let's imagine we decided to take a laser and shine it in the direction of the focal point, right? In the direction that this reflected light ray came. Well, if we shine light in this direction, it's going to hit that same spot and it's going to hit at the same angle, and it's got to bounce off at the same angle, so the reflected light in this case is going to go back. And that's the exact same lines that was drawn, except the direction has changed. This just makes the point that if we have a valid path that a light ray takes, based on the law of reflection, that any path is reversible. So since the first path that we found coming in to the right and then bouncing off this way was valid, the exact opposite would be valid, where if we just reverse directions, that has to be also true based on the law of reflection. If we had seven parallel light rays instead of three, and we wanted all of them to come together to some common focal point, we'd actually need a separate flat mirror angled slightly differently so that the reflected ray all happens to pass through the same common focal point. We could either have seven different mirrors, or we could just have one curved surface so the curve made all parallel light rays go through some common focal point. This is actually what a concave mirror does. It takes parallel light rays and causes them to bounce off and pass through some common focal point. So this actually helps us get all the rules we need for drawing any ray diagram for concave mirrors. So the first one is, hey, if you have a concave mirror, any light ray that's coming in parallel to what's called the principal axis. The principal axis is just a line that crosses through the middle of a mirror and crosses perpendicular to the mirror surface at that point. So if we have a line that comes in parallel to that axis, after it bounces off of our concave mirror, it's got to bounce off and go through the focal point. That's rule number one. A light ray parallel to the principal axis will reflect off the mirror and travel through the focal point. But wait a minute. If that path is valid, that means 
the reverse should also be true. If something comes from the focal point direction, it's got to bounce off the mirror and go parallel with the axis. Well, let's just take another path that happens to go through the focal point direction. Let's say this blue path. So if we have light traveling in a straight line that happens to pass through the focal point and come from that direction, after hitting the mirror, it's going to bounce off and it's going to travel back the way that it came parallel to the principal axis. So that is rule number two. If a ray comes from the direction of the focal point, it will reflect off and travel parallel to the principal axis. To come up with our third rule, let's go back to that first reflected path. Why does the first ray bounce off and go through the focal point? Well, remember, it comes from the law of reflection, where the incoming angle is the same as the reflected angle. And this line right here, remember, is a line that is perpendicular or normal to the mirror surface. So this is perpendicular. It's going to come back and go this way. And the principal axis, that's also perpendicular to the surface at this point. And if we trace that back, what we find is where those lines cross is known as the center of curvature. We're assuming our concave mirror is circular. And so this spot right here represents the center of curvature of that curved mirror. And the center of curvature is always twice as far away as the focal point from the mirror. So if you know what the focal length is, like how far away the focal point is from the surface of the mirror, the center of curvature is just going to be twice that distance away. Well, let's imagine we had a ray that was coming from the focal point direction along that line. When it hits here, it's hitting at what angle? Well, it's hitting, it's in the same direction as the perpendicular line. So there's no angle between the incoming light and that perpendicular line, so there can't be any angle between the outgoing light. So when it hits here, it's like hitting a flat surface and it's going to bounce straight back like this. So that's rule number three. If a ray comes from the direction of the center of curvature, it will reflect off and travel back in the same direction. These three rules are enough for us to explain why a concave mirror can produce upright bigger images and upside down or inverted smaller images. So let's do that. Let's say we have a tea light candle, and let's say there's no mirror yet. Let's just imagine where light goes that comes off of the top of that candle flame. Well, light's going to go in all directions. At the very tip, let's say it acts like a point light source that streams in all directions. Some of it's going to go to the observer. So where does the observer think that light came from? Well, it traces all the rays that happen to fall into the observer's eye back. Your, your brain kind of does. And your brain thinks, oh, light looks like it came from there. And it actually did. <laughs> so you see a candle flame there if you're looking at the tip of a candle flame. But let's say we had a concave mirror. We put it off to the right. And the observer looked past the actual candle and looked into the mirror. Some of that light is going to be reflected and produce an image that happens to appear in the observer's mind. So how would we predict where that image would form and what it would look like? Well, let's pick some of the paths of light that we know how it behaves. Think back to the rules we just came up with. Rule number one, if a light ray comes in parallel to the principal axis, that's kind of this one right here, then it has to bounce off, or after bouncing off the mirror, it has to pass through the focal point. So that one would bounce off that way. What's rule number two? If any light ray comes from the focal point direction, it will have to bounce off parallel to the principal axis. Well, this path right here goes through and comes from the focal point direction. When it bounces off of the mirror, it has to bounce off parallel to the principal axis. And what's that third rule we came up with? If light comes from the center of curvature direction, it's going to bounce straight back. Well, here's a path that goes through and comes from the center of curvature direction, hits the mirror. When it bounces back, it's going to go straight back there like that. So let's just look at the reflected light. That's these three red paths. Does, does any of this light actually get into the observer's eye? Well, actually, one of the three paths would hit the observer's eye. But now let's just imagine the eye is big enough so that it's going to capture any of the reflected light, these three paths. And where does the observer think that light came from? The brain kind of traces each ray back, this one back, this one back, this one back, and it appears like those three rays that entered the eye originated from this spot. They didn't. Like, your brain doesn't know that the light actually came off of the candle, bounced off of a smooth, concave mirror surface, and passed through that point. Your brain just thinks it came from that point. And so your brain sees the tip of the candle at this location. Well, where does it see the rest of the flame or the, the holder of the wax for the tea light candle? So let's do this one more time. Let's do this for, and I'm going to take away the other rays. We're just going to focus on the ones that were reflected. So let's now do this for the bottom of the flame. 
light coming from the bottom of the flame is also spewing out in all directions, but let's just pick some paths we know how it's going to bounce off. So let's draw one path parallel to the principal axis. When it hits the mirror, it has to bounce off and go through the focal point. And now let's draw one from the bottom of the flame that goes through the focal point. And when it hits off the mirror, we know it has to bounce off parallel. So here are these two green paths. They're going to enter the observer's eye. And where does the observer think they came from? Well, those things cross here. The observer, it appears in their mind like the light from the bottom of the flame came from that location. And if we did this other time for other parts of the object that's either producing light or giving off reflected light from other light sources around, we'd find out that they would line up over here, producing an image in the mind of the observer. So here's how we would describe this image. The image is smaller in height than the original object. So in physics, we call that a reduced image. It's smaller in height. It's upside down, and in physics, we call that an inverted image. And it's actually inverted both vertically and horizontally. We can see that our ray diagram predicts it's going to be upside down. But if we did this kind of from a top-down perspective, it would also invert things from left to right. That's why when you look into a mirror, you can't read what's on your sweatshirt or your t-shirt that looks backwards because it's horizontally inverted. And this is actually what we call a real image. A real image is one where if you place a screen at that location, an image would actually form. And why would that be? If we put, let's say, a sheet of paper here or a piece of cardboard, light that comes from the top of the candle flame, when it bounces off the mirror, actually comes back together again at the spot, lighting it up with orange light. And reflected light from the bottom of that aluminum that's holding the wax is going to bounce off and come together again right there. So it's going to make a gray color. So if where the image appears to be in the observer's mind is also a location we could put a screen or some kind of solid surface and we would see an image on that solid surface, we call it a real image. And remember, this is consistent with the video we saw of a concave mirror earlier in the video where I was in the background of the classroom waving. My reflected image was both smaller and upside down. And remember, what did the tea light candle look like, which was close to the mirror? It made a larger image that was not upside down. It was, it was actually upright. So let's put our tea light candle closer to a, this concave mirror and find out if it's closer to the concave mirror, in this case, closer than the focal length or the focal point, what would we predict the image would look like? We know it's going to be bigger. We know it's going to be upright. But let's see if we can use our ray diagrams to show that that would actually be the case. So let's go through our rules. Let's find out again, you know, where the light coming from the top of the candle flame would appear to an observer on the left. That's looking into the mirror, looking for some reflected image. So the first rule, we draw one that goes parallel to the principal axis towards the mirror, and when it bounces off, it has to go through the focal point. Our second rule was we have to draw a ray that comes from the focal point direction. We can't draw one here to go through the focal point. That's not going to go to the mirror and reflect off. But we can draw a path of light that comes from that direction in this way. And when it hits the mirror, rule number two says, hey, it has to bounce off and go parallel with the principal axis. Now, these two rays are diverging. They're spreading apart. They're not going to come together again. So where does the reflected light coming off the top of the candle of flame appear to be located in the observer's mind? In order to do that, we trace any ray that enters the eye straight back. Your brain doesn't know if light bounces off of something or curves, and our experience of everyday reality has taught us to interpret light as if it just traveled in straight lines. So we're going we're gonna to trace the top one straight back. It came from somewhere in that direction. The bottom one's going to come from somewhere along that direction. And you can see where those two dotted lines cross. These two light rays in our brain appear to have originated from that location. So the observer sees the top of the candle flame behind the mirror. The light didn't come from the, behind the mirror. It can't, right, because it bounces off the front, but it appears to have come from behind the mirror. Well, let's do the same thing for light that reflected off the bottom of our tea light candle. We're going to draw one that goes parallel to the axis, and when it bounces off, it has to pass through the focal point, so it's going to go in this direction. Rule number two is going to be, let's draw some light that come, reflects off of here from the focal point direction, like this. And when it bounces off the mirror, it has to bounce off and travel back towards the way that it came, but parallel to the principal axis. These two rays, 
reflected off of the mirror, enter the observer's eye, and where do they both appear to have come from? Well, we have to trace each ray back straight back to figure out where they came from. So we trace this one straight back, we trace this one straight back, and it looks like the reflected light came from that location. And so in the observer's mind, the bottom will be here, the top will be here, and we can just fill in the rest. And so that's what the image looks like. And no surprise, it's bigger and it's upright. So how would we describe this? Well, it's bigger, and so we'd use the word enlarged. It's an enlarged image, and it's upright. It's not upside down or inverted. And is this a real image? Could we put a screen here, and there would be an image that shows up? No, because light never actually gets there. It, this image only appears in the observer's mind. It appears to be behind the mirror. But if we put a screen there, nothing's going to show up because no light that, came, that either came off of the candle flame or was reflected from the bottom ever is here. And so we would call this a virtual image because no image would form on a screen placed at that location. It only exists in the observer's mind. We're going to end this video with talking about convex mirrors. And these are a little bit simpler because there's only one thing that happens. If you think back to the beginning of the video, both close things and far away things were both upright and smaller. We'll just try to figure out if they're virtual or real based on array diagrams. We need to develop some rules for convex mirrors first. So let's think through what would happen if we have a ray that comes in parallel to our principal axis. Well, because of the way that it's curved, let's think through how is this going to reflect off of our mirror? Well, we've got to get a line that's perpendicular to the surface, and we can do that if we draw one that comes from the center of curvature. So we're going to draw a line from the center of curvature out where this incoming ray hits, and the reflected ray is going to bounce off at equal angles. And let's do that for another one. So another ray that comes in parallel to the axis. Let's find that perpendicular line so we can use the law of reflection coming from the center of curvature on the right side of our convex mirror and bounce off at equal angles. And these two reflected rays, let's say we've got an observer on the left. Where do those rays appear to have come from? So let's trace this one back. Looks like it came somewhere from that direction. And this one looks like it came somewhere from straight line path back. It looks like that these two rays appear to have come from some common, we'll call virtual focal point behind the mirror, right? The parallel light rays, they don't ever come back together again. That's a concave mirror. They actually get spread out. But if we have an observer, those spreading out rays look like they came from some common focal point, which doesn't exist just in the mind of an observer, which is why we're calling it a virtual focal point. If those two reflected rays look like they came from that common virtual focal point, with a convex mirror, we're going to assume that any ray that comes in parallel to the principal axis will bounce off and reflect like they came from that virtual focal point behind the mirror. So let's use that idea to come up with really the only two rules that we need to draw any ray diagram for convex mirrors. The first rule is a light ray traveling parallel to the principal axis will reflect off the mirror and travel away from the virtual focal point behind the mirror, like we've already talked about. So here's rule number one. Comes in parallel to the principal axis, bounces off like it came from that virtual focal point. And rule number two is going to be the reverse of that path. Remember, any valid ray path based on the law of reflection is always reversible. So that means if we were to shine a light or direct light towards the virtual focal point, it's not going to get there, but if it goes in that direction, when it bounces off, it has to go back parallel to that principal axis. So I'm just going to draw another path, just another one that happens to be going towards the focal point. All right, it doesn't get there, but when it bounces off, it has to bounce off and go back parallel to the principal axis. So that's rule number two. If a ray travels toward the virtual focal point behind the mirror, it will reflect off and travel parallel to the axis. So we just have one more ray diagram to do to put these into use. So here's a tea light candle placed in front of a convex mirror. Earlier in the video, we saw that no matter where the object was, close or far away, the image that's produced from the reflected light should be both smaller and upright. In this case, in any other ray diagram, to figure out where an image would form and how we would describe that image, you always want to start with light that comes from the top of the object. So where does the light go coming off the top of the candle flame? Well, we know in all directions, but just pick the ones consistent with our rules. So let's pick some of the light that happens to come parallel to the principal axis. When it bounces off of our convex mirror, the bounced off light has to look like it came from the virtual focal point direction. So it's going to bounce off 
like this. And when you do array diagrams, I would strongly encourage you to use solid lines for the actual path that light travels and use dashed lines for reference, like in this case for, to show like from the focal point direction or when you're figuring out virtual images. Rule number two is we now need to pick some light that came from the top of the flame and was going towards the virtual focal point direction. So like here's the dash line just for reference that shows the path from the top of the flame towards the virtual focal point. So now let's draw a solid line to show the actual path the light travels. So it's gonna come here and hit our mirror, but it's gonna bounce off. It's not gonna get behind the mirror. If it's going towards the virtual focal point, rule two says it has to bounce off and go parallel with the principal axis. And that's enough reflected light to predict where the image will form and to describe it. So remember, our brain assumes, or the observer's brain assumes, these light rays that enter the eye traveled in straight lines to get there. So one is already traced straight back here. Now we need to trace this one straight back. So we need to make a horizontal line behind the mirror. And where do these two reflected rays appear to have come from? It looks like they appear to have come from that spot. So the observer is gonna see the top of the candle flame at this location. So if the top of the candle flame appears here, where does the bottom of the tea light candle appear in the image? Here's a hint. Any part of the object that's giving off a reflecting light that's on the principal axis, that part will show up in the image also on the principal axis. And so it's just gonna be right below where the top appears to be. And so if the top is here, the bottom is here, we can kind of fill in the rest. The image is gonna to appear to be smaller and upright. So it's reduced in size, it is upright in orientation and this is a virtual image, why? Because if a screen is placed at this location, no image will show up. This image only appears in the observer's mind. Now you should be able to use what you learned to draw any ray diagram for both a concave mirror and a convex mirror to predict where the image will form and what that image will look like.